Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles, your favorite true crime podcast. I am Donnie, and with me is a man that doesn't expect to have the last laugh, but that doesn't keep him from laughing. It's Dale. <laughs> I think that's the truth. That man will laugh at anything. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, a, I'm a happy guy. Yeah, this week has proved that. That's no <laughs> doubt about it. Yeah, we had a lot of fun this week. We? We have had a, we've had a ball. I'm telling you, man. Yeah. It, it's good to be back in the saddle, ain't it? Yeah, we'll jump in feet first and, do it and have a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> a little pork rind humor there. <laughs> That's right. What's going on, bud? Oh, no. I don't know, man. How about yourself? It just feels good to be back in the saddle. And we got these uh, brand new boom mics, and we really appreciate uh, people throwing in some gas money here and there to help us out. And, man, it's it's really going to be cool having this. It's good upgrading the crack house a little bit. Putting, a little fancy today. Yeah, we feel fancy. <laughs> That's right, man. We should feel fancy today because we got a hell of a show. Man, I'm telling you, the episode we've got today... We got we put on our big boy pants today, didn't we? We did. We we put on our big boy underwear and our big boy pants. <laughs> Stepping up a little bit. Yeah. But we're just gonna forego the shout outs and all the buy a t shirt stuff. Yeah. But you can still buy a t shirt. You can still buy a t shirt. <laughs> throw in some gas money and all that stuff. This is our episode of Subliminal Buy T shirt. <laughs> buy a shirt. Yep. Cups. Dale, today we are recapping on our murder of Lisa Pruitt that we covered last week in episode 119. As you know, we covered all the, the timeline for the murder of Lisa Pruitt from when Dan Dreifert, you know, he got out of the hospital and was going to see her at the school and uh, they were supposed to have a meetup that night and unfortunately she didn't make it. They were, she Yeah, everything went south from there. Yeah. Let me just give a little backstory on who we have on the show. We have James Renner. Mm-hmm. He is, if you don't know James Renner, you need to know who he is. Because he <laughs> he is a, a novelist. Uh, he has a couple podcasts out there. He is uh, Actually, he wrote his first novel in 2012, The Man from Primrose Lane. Um, he wrote another novel, The Great Forgetting. He is also a, a work of nonfiction called True Crime Addict. And which I have a T-shirt, by the way, it says True Crime Addict. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, James Renner is also the founder of the Portslight Project, which is a nonprofit that raises money for new DNA testing of cold cases in Ohio. And actually in 2020, there was an arrest made in their first case, which was the unsolved murder of Barbara Blatnick. So this was thanks to their funding of genetic genealogy. So this is a pretty dang cool to have james renner on our show man he also has a show on id channel right um i did uh i but it was a, um it was called the lake erie um murders or the lake erie's coldest cases it was just a very limited series six episodes uh and it was released through their website at first they're very short episodes i think like 15 20 minutes each okay but then uh, i think they released them through streaming too so every once in a while somebody um catches one of those which is kind of nice yeah you know? very nice all right let's just jump into this thing and um talk about lisa pruitt a little bit you know we I'm, I'm curious how you came across lisa pruitt's case to begin with what what where did your interest in it come from well actually it was from me i i follow true crime garage i subscribe to those guys and you know, every oh, week, sure. if they have a, a show that I'm interested in, you know, I'll catch it and listen to what they have to say about it and their their take on it. But when they, uh, you guys done the six parter Shaker Heights, mm. I'm like, I'm like, man, you know, and you had all the the transcripts and all the uh, interviews and everything was acted out and all you know all that. I was I was all in on this. I'm like, man, why has this case not been solved by now? Why, you know, if all these statements and why couldn't they, you know, law enforcement there piece all this together and what of what was happening? Sure. So, sure. You know, I uh, we we did that series I think about three years ago, mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, COVID, of course, happened, and I at the time I was in New Orleans, and we were putting together a TV series based on genetic genealogy. And so I was planning on being there for at least a month and a half, maybe a couple months. And we were about two days before we were supposed to start filming. And uh, they, that was March 13th, 
2020. Um, and of course they shut everything down and sent everybody home at the time we were told, Oh, it's just going to be a couple weeks. Of course that became a couple years. <laughs> so when I came back here and it, and it became quite obvious that we weren't going to, uh, have to, we weren't going to be able to leave for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, I finally had the time to go through all the police reports and, uh, paperwork through the prosecutor's office here in Cuyahoga County on the Lisa Pruitt case. And I, over the, over the years I'd, I'd continued to gather reports, but I I had not had a chance to go through them. And I thought if I was ever going to write a book about this, this, there's, this was the time I didn't have anything else to do. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I went into it with the intention of clearing Kevin Young's name because I never believed for a minute that he had anything to do with the crime. There's no evidence that links him to the crime scene, for one. Right. Uh, and I figured I would find more evidence uh, that would uh, possibly implicate Dan Dreifert. Uh, unexpectedly, I came through the process also believing that Dan Dreifert had nothing to do with Lisa Pruitt's murder, as strange as it seems. Because in these reports, I learned about I learned that there was an, another young man who was at the scene of the crime that night mm -hmm. that the police had never told us about, that had never come out at trial, that prosecutors knew about, but they didn't, and you know certainly weren't going to announce it. And um, I believe this man, uh, young man at the time, David Brannigan was the person who killed Lisa Pruitt. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, he passed away in 2017, uh, essentially drank himself to death. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I could, I could talk about the, the reasons behind that, but that's, that's kind of how the, the book came about. And the book will be uh, published uh, next July, July 2023. Okay. Can't wait for yeah, it. Yeah. Thanks. Mm-hmm. So let's uh the night Lisa was on her way to Dan's house. You know, they had mm -hmm. scheduled this this little rendezvous. She was supposed to ride her bicycle over and you know, obviously she didn't make it, but you know, we'd heard in another podcast I I can't I fail it's failed me to remember which one it was, but uh when they were searching the area, they would it was reported they found in the bushes a hammer, a, a condom and unwrapped yeah, and uh, maybe a bottle or something. Um, I've only heard that in mm -hmm. one place. Can you elaborate on that? And was is that true? Yeah, they found a number of things around there. They they did find a hammer, though it doesn't appear to have anything to do with the crime. Um, she was, um, yeah. This the, the place where they found her was real close. I mean, it, it, it's. It's one property over from her boyfriend's house, Dan Dreifert, where he mm -hmm. was living at the time with his parents. And there's kind of like this um, wall of shrubs that uh, that you'd have to go through from the sidewalk. And then you'd enter in this kind of open area that was actually the way back, you know, the backyard of this other home. And so it also had like a line of bushes separating that property also from Dryford's. And so there's this essentially a secluded little corner that would have made for a nice makeout spot. And I think that's where they used to meet up. And yeah, in the bushes, they did find a hammer um, that had nothing to do with it. She was stabbed about 21 times yeah. and, you know, it punctured her lungs and, um, she bled out very quickly and died quickly. Um, mm -hmm. The and yes, they also found a an unwrapped condom, which becomes a very important piece of evidence in my book. Uh, the now the condom was actually found pretty close to, or actually it was a it, it was a wrapper. It was an opened wrapper of a of a condom, and it was found very close to. Uh, the door to Dreyfurt's house, oh. um, and uh, you know there were there were berries 
some of these bushes had berries and a couple of those berries were also found near the door to Dreyford's house as well, hmm. which you would think, you know, circumstantial evidence that points to Dreyford. Um, as crazy as this sounds, I think what happened that night after spending uh, so much time researching this is I believe she and this explains some of Dreyford's behavior. Um, uh, and this is just my opinion. Well, I'll but, tell you, he's a weird cat. I can tell you that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everybody involved in this case is, for sure. I'm telling you. <laughs> um, you know, it, it is the day that he gets out of the mental hospital um, where his father had him committed. Mm -hmm. His father also worked for that hospital um, in a pretty high position. So it seems as though he, he pulled some strings and used some favors to, to put him in there. And I don't know that Dan necessarily needed to be in there. Right. Um, so it's, it's a whole mess. And... You know, it's the night he gets out and, Le and they make these plans where Lisa's going to ride to his house on her bike. Um, I think it's possible that she actually made it there and they got together and they hooked up, they had sex. And then he went in to wash up or um, to just check and make sure that, you know, the parents weren't up or anything. Mm -hmm. And I think it was in that time space where she was attacked and, and murdered by uh, it's it's possible that the person was even there watching them have sex in this backyard and um so let me let me tell you just a little bit about uh david brannigan i'm happy to answer any any questions or talk about whatever you want but um what was interesting is uh during a couple things um so this name kept coming up in the police reports this david brannigan and the whole crux of the police and the prosecutor's uh, um case against kevin young the weird kid in school that mm -hmm. you know that that they went after uh, for the murder was that he was at arabica coffee shop that day and uh, a boy named a teenage boy named uh tex tex workman mm -hmm. came into arabica now tex was also good friends with dan dreyford and dan dan had already told tex that lisa was going to sneak out and so he sent tex into into town which was like three or four blocks away to pick up some smokes and while tex was out getting uh, the running this errand, he stops in an Arabica and talks to Kevin and tells Kevin that Lisa's coming over. So the police are like, see, he knew whoever killed Lisa had to have known she was coming over and Kevin Young knew. Well, there was one other young man at Arabica at that time that overheard that conversation and that person was David Brannigan. Hmm. So uh, later that night, uh, Bran again and his girlfriend at the time, they go out on a date, they, they go um, to dinner, and then they end up back at Shaker Heights around um, 1130. He walks her home, and then he walks, to, walks from her house back to where he lived at the time. And he lived on Sedgwick Road, which is important because it's the road directly behind Dreyfurt's house. Um, Dreyfurt was living on Lee Road, but if you walk through his backyard, you'd end up on Sedgwick. <clears throat> That's where Brannigan lived. So he was on his way home, and he passed by the crime scene at around the time of the murders. And we know that he was there around the time of the murders because he goes to the police the next day. And he says, oh, hey, um, I was at this bus stop and there's this black guy there and he was talking about Lisa's murder. I think uh, I think maybe maybe he did it and maybe you should look for this black guy. Well, um, you know, that's one way to get the cops attention in Shaker Heights, of course. But they also question, like, who's this weird kid coming in talking about the murder? So. Uh, they find out that he walked past the crime scene that night. They're like, whoa, you know, what's that all about? And he's like, oh, I was just walking home. 
he's like, I would have been home before the murder anyways. But he describes uh, two police officers that he saw at the scene that night. And one of them had a canine unit, a dog that was being used for the search. And that only happened directly before they discovered Lisa's body. Oh. And he would only know about that if he was w- watching them from a secluded place because they didn't see him. Right. So, um, you know, he's, and, and later on his girlfriend goes to the prosecutor and says, Hey, you know, and by then they had broken up, you know, it'd been three years since then when the trial happened, she's like, why didn't you ever look into, you know, him, my, my boyfriend at the time, they're like, Oh, we, we have a better case against Kevin. And besides you were with him at the time of the murder. She's like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. I was not. And he had plenty of time to get there to commit the crime. Now, other things we know about David Brannigan, he collected knives. He was obsessed with uh, hunting knives and always had one on him. Uh, he was also breaking into homes in the area. Uh, he was he he would tell his girlfriends about this. And he said that he was breaking into homes to, you know, steal little almost like for the fun of it because he wouldn't steal money but he'd steal little trinkets Mm -hmm. and and he collected them in a box in his bedroom more for the thrill of it yeah 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 and in the days leading up to lisa's murder uh, there were a number of homes right there that were broken into the house directly behind dryford was broken into and the house where lisa's body was found the people that lived there about 20 minutes before the murder a woman that was inside the house said she thought it sounded like somebody was trying to get into her car. So I think all of that was Brannigan for sure. And so the, I, uh, I tracked down, I found out he was deceased. I tracked down his common law wife, the mother of his child who he spent the last seven years with. And I didn't think she talked to me, but she was super nice. She invited me inside and we sat and we talked about David for a while. And, and, and finally, I, I came out and just asked her, I said, do you think it's possible that he's the one that actually killed Lisa Pruitt? And she thought for a minute, she said, well, she, let me tell you a story. She said, when, when David was in preschool, uh, uh, a, a boy pushed him down on the playground. And he didn't do anything. He didn't react. Uh, but when it came time for lunch, he sat down next to this boy. And when the boy wasn't looking, he poured Comet Cleaner in his sandwich. He, she said, uh, that's that's who David was all of his life. She said, do wow. I think he killed Lisa Pruitt? She said, it's definitely a possibility. Um, she said, I wouldn't doubt it. So, uh, Which leads me to the next big piece of this, which is... Um, He's also the only witness in a in a in a double murder <laughs> that happened five years before Lisa, and only eight doors north of where the Dreifords lived. It's it happened on the same block. It was this older couple, Philip and Dorothy Porter, and they were kind of big names in the neighborhood. She was an artist, and he was a former editor at the Plain Dealer, which is our big newspaper. Yeah. And uh, they were both stabbed to death in their home one night. And the next day, uh, David Brannigan and uh, um, a couple of his friends, actually, they didn't come forward. The police eventually came to them and they told them this story about how the night of the double murder, they were lighting firecrackers off in an abandoned garage next door to the porters and saw a black man so he goes back to the story right he's like oh we saw this black man come running out of the house i'm sure he did it now the when the family got to the house all the doors were locked from the inside and the only way to for somebody to come in for the murder was through the small window in the kitchen certainly a teenage boy would be able to do that uh and i think it's quite possible that he um snuck into that window either by himself or with his friends or his friends stayed out. But I think he went in there and I think Mrs. Porter interrupted him and 
he freaked out, realized that she knew who he was because he lived right behind her and uh, decided to kill her and her husband. Um, so unfortunately, there's a man sitting in prison uh, for those double murders. And I'm trying to I'm trying to get him out, too. Now, um, that would another be, person. Who, that would be Donnie Soki, wouldn't it? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And he uh, there's absolutely no. That's a longer piece of the story, but there's no evidence linking Donnie to those murders. And it seems as though he was um, pulled into a false confession for those murders in exchange for better accommodations in uh, in prison. Yeah. We didn't mention David Brannigan in our episode because we was we were actually hoping that you would enlighten us more on him. Okay. So that that really helped out a lot and try right. yeah. oh, and tie that in. Good. But, yeah, he's uh I think I think he's a serial killer that kind of went under under the radar. Hmm. Um, and uh, uh you know, I think I can tie him to at least three murders. Uh it's possible he was he did more than that, but I, I don't know that we'll ever know. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the all the friends getting together and pointing the finger at Kevin Young? Where did yeah. where did this come about? What what was the reasoning behind that? Well, you know, it, it's it's one of the most frustrating things about this case. So. Yeah, the the circumstantial evidence at first definitely pointed to Dan Dreifert because of course you know he was he was the boyfriend she was found a hundred feet from his back door on the day he gets out of the mental hospital where he would write her letters saying please don't come near me when I get out I don't want to kill you right. I mean I poke your eyes it's out crazy really nice. <laughs> um, the so the murder happens early morning on Friday and then on Saturday a bunch of his friends. Uh, go to the Shaker Heights Police Department and start pointing the finger at Kevin Young. Basically, oh, he must have done it. He's the weird kid in school. He has a temper. And, you know, I think nowadays uh, Kevin Young might have been diagnosed as um, on the spectrum. You know, he was just a weird kid. And uh, so um, they, of course, didn't want it to be their friend, Dan Dreifert. And I don't think they I don't think any of these kids purposefully had in mind, oh, it must be our friend Dan. So let's let's blame another kid. I think they were dumb teenagers <laughs> of, you know, elite community members right. um, who always were in kind of a position of, um, uh, you know, power themselves or privilege at least and they really didn't want it to be dan so I, I think they were like well who who in the world could it be and they settled on kevin young and and uh you know sent the police that way mm -hmm. now the the detective that caught the case unfortunately was a man named um tom gray and it was gray's first big case and before he was a police detective, he um, was a, a fry cook at Popeye's Chicken. And, you know, so he was definitely not up to the task of this assignment. And so you have kind of a perfect storm of, of all, uh, you know, this, this uh, unfortunate things that, that just happened. And everything uh kind of piled on top of kevin young eventually mm -hmm. so um gray goes to ohio state and interviews kevin young mm -hmm. now me and dale have talked about this case and we have talked about this case I'm telling you. <laughs> and why in the world would kevin young spend two days with him in a hotel room just chatting why didn't yeah. Why didn't he just shut up? And 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 yeah, I'll answer that one first. Why didn't he just shut up? And I got I got some more questions about this. Well, I, you know, again, I, I think it goes back to Kevin potentially being on the spectrum. Okay. Um, you know, he he knew that he was not guilty, and I think he thought by talking to the police he could convince them of his innocence too. Uh, you know. 
I think it it just didn't come together in his mind that he was really, really in a lot of trouble. Okay. And all along the way, the police were assuring him that, you know, at least up until that night, that they were talking to him like they were talking to half a dozen other suspects and other teenagers. They're like, hey, everybody's talking to us. Why don't you talk to us? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, it all changed that night. He, I mean, it's amazing. He didn't confess, even though he didn't do it. Right. Uh, exactly. you know, there are a lot of people that, that would have confessed, even though they were innocent, just to, just to be done with whatever it was like 36 hours of interrogation. Yeah. They sure buddy cop the heck out of him. <laughs> what was that? I said, they sure buddy copped the, the heck out of him. They really yeah. just buttered and buttered and buttered, but he never gave in. So, Props to him yeah, for that, yeah. yeah. So Kevin must have been very high functioning if he was on the spectrum, you know, to to uh, yeah. test out of some classes and things. Oh yeah, he was he was a pretty smart kid. Okay, but still on the spectrum. Okay, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm not somebody that can diagnose that, but yeah. you know, having a son of my own who is on the spectrum, you mm -hmm. know, I see a lot of similar a lot of similar traits there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Kevin's like the, I told uh, Donnie today, I said, you know, the more I, because we've listened, well, I've listened to the, the True Crime Garage, the reading of the, you know, all the transcripts over and over and over, and it's like, man, this is kind of like uh, Stranger Things this year, you know, like the girl gets killed and everybody blames the Eddie Munson, and this is the Eddie Munson. Oh, right, case. yeah, it's yeah, like I didn't really weird. that together, yeah, but the, it's The rock and roll Metallica similar. kid, yeah, it's like, wow. Yeah. But man, the, the more I listen to those transcripts, it just gets more confusing because I'm like, man, who's who's lying or is everyone lying? It just it just keep blowing my mind. Yeah, you know, I I think a lot of those kids were um, at least exaggerating the truth when it came to Kevin Young. Yeah, I think so too. Mm -hmm. And they gave uh, Kevin Young several opportunities to call his parents and his mom, and he mm -hmm. he sort of blew that off. I wonder why did why would he blow that off and I think he was probably smart enough to know that his parents would put an end to the interview. And again, I think he thought he could convince these cops that, that he was innocent and, mm -hmm. and be done with it. So when he finally got a hold of his mom, he talked to his mom. She told him to shut up and they got a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, they, they, uh, yeah, she, they, they put an end to it and, I don't know who they got that day, but eventually their lead attorney becomes a guy named Mark Devan, mm -hmm. uh, who I've gotten to know very well in the last couple of years as I've put together this book. And just uh, super smart, super lucky that they were able to, to get this uh, Mark Devan to represent him because um, he ultimately was able to get Kevin acquitted in court. Yeah. Not that it helped them, because even after the acquittal, everybody still believed that he did it. He just got a fancy lawyer to get him off. Right. I guess about of all the transcripts that we listened to on True Crime Garage, Kim Rathbone's interview was the most perplexing to me. This girl, from what I found, I mean, she's an attorney now or some kind of lawyer now, I think. And listen to her statement. I mean, she was she was law lawyer material then. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the way they asked her a question, and she would say, "Do you, how do you want me to answer this? This way, this way, or this way?" And then give them a short answer and, and short enough to where the they would just go into the next question. It's kind of odd. Yeah, yeah. She was definitely savvy. I, I don't know. She, I know a lot of those kids also had parents who were lawyers. I'm not sure if she was one of those. I can't remember. Can't remember what her dad did. I think mm -hmm. it's possible. I I don't know for sure though. But even in her statement, when she said once she said that she was was studying and then she was asleep, and then she heard the mm -hmm. screams and then they said, and she said what time and then she told them and said, well, how did you know? So I looked at the clock. I was studying. Goes well. Wait. You mean you're awake? I'm like. You just lied right there within 10 seconds of each other, you know? Yeah. A lot of these kids' yeah. stories, they're, they're very inconsistent. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's still weird to me that, you know, so Dan got out of the hospital that day and was planning to have a party at his house. And Lisa was just going to be one of these people that, that were supposed to be there. But there's also 
you know, Kim Rathbone got an invitation, um, uh, Chris Jones, um, maybe David Messenger, and uh, Chris Jones and I think Rathbone had even said they were coming, but then changed their minds at the last minute. You know, is that true? Or, you know, did some of these kids actually make it over to Dreyfurt's house at some time? Um, not, not really sure. Everybody seems to be telling like half truths. Yes. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's they did go over there. And then that's when they all got together and said, "Let's let's just say that we weren't, but we weren't over there that night." And it's 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 possible because you know y- y- you think like a teenager. You know they know they didn't have anything to do with it, and if they say they were there, then it then it could implicate them and lead the police away from who whoever really did it so you know they could have been doing it with the best intentions or were they legitimately just all canceled you know at the last minute but it's it's kind of hard to believe yeah uh uh, you know so it's it's hard to tell exactly what what really happened that that night right um yeah it's it's bizarre and then you add like uh the stuff with the cough syrup you know dan was taking cough syrup to get high and there's really to me um a brilliant moment in the trial when you know devan basically is convinced that dan was high on cough syrup that night but um the police found a bag in his room when they after the murder when they searched everything inside this bag were empty cough syrup bottles and dan had you know explained that away to the police he's like oh yeah those are old bottles they came from virginia i took this trip you know for a youth camp to virginia earlier in the summer they have nothing to do with anything well the van was smart enough to actually look at the cough syrup <laughs> Uh, bottles to see that they were uh, finest brand cough medicine, which is a local regional grocery store only in Northeast Ohio. Uh And the only day they really could have been purchased were the day of the murder. So, you know, it's possible that Lisa herself is the one who brought that cough syrup with her that night, which is, which you know, of course, immediately opens up the question, well, then how did they end up in Dan's room if he never saw her that night? It's possible, too, that Tex is the one that brought him over, but he always denied it. So, um, but that was a really neat moment in the trial because Dan's on the stand and he's like, oh, these are all from Virginia. And uh, Devan's like, okay, look in there and why don't you pull the cough syrup bottles out? And he looks in the bag, and and the kid notices finest brand is on it, and he's like, "Oh shit!" And he's, <laughs> he's like, "Well, he's so he he says in court, he says, oh, I I stand corrected, I stand corrected.'" He had to backtrack a little bit, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Dan didn't do himself any favors when he's like, "Well, you know, I forgot she was coming over," because I'm like, you know, if you hadn't seen your girlfriend in a month or two, and you ain't been together, and she's coming over, you're not gonna forget. Yeah, we've all been teenage boys. That's right. Um, that was probably the only thing on his mind. Exactly. Yeah, that's what we've said. You would be laser focused on your one girlfriend thing. coming over. Yeah. yeah, one thing. Yeah, yeah. That's that's why I think, to me, the, the scenario, as weird as it as it sounds, I think the scenario that makes the most sense is they did get together, and it was after he went back inside to to, to wash up and or you know whatever. That, that she was murdered and then you know that's why he was freaking out and telling his sister oh my god that you know the police are going to find uh you know it, or his sister at, at some point somebody was worried that they were going to find his semen on her mm-hmm. or in her right and uh they they never did but you know you'd be concerned about that even you know, if you're a teenage boy you enough to use a condom um so you know i think that could be what happened um and he was inside when she heard the the screams. And it's interesting to note that, you know, his dad also heard the screams. And at that moment, he noticed that Dan was wearing shoes. Dan Dan had his shoes on. So, 
um, it kind of all fits. Uh, it's it's a weird scenario, but you know, if that's the case, hopefully after this book comes out or, you know, if he listens to this podcast, I, I'd love for Dan to confirm that. Yeah. Uh, right. Be, because I, I think if he would, it, it, it's more evidence actually that points to David Brannigan. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is so crazy. Yeah. That, that I hadn't even thought about that. That's... I didn't, yeah. I hadn't even thought about them actually maybe hooking up that night. That, that didn't even enter my mind. So that's a very <laughs> good, very good possibility. No doubt. I mean, it, it would explain why Dreifert was acting guilty. Yeah. You know, everything about, you know, touching, you know, he told the police officer, oh, my fingerprints are probably on the bike because he knew, you know, he had helped her put the bike in the bushes or something. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that I, I had mentioned the cadaver dog before and the cadaver dog uh, led the police around the block to Sedgwick, um, where Brannigan lived, and that's where it lost the scent again. Mm-hmm. So even the dog kind of implicates Brannigan in yeah. the whole thing. What did they did they find any DNA on Lisa or clothing or fingerprints of any kind, any kind of forensics at all? Um they yes. Uh so there is a um well there's a boot print or a shoe print that was left in blood, I believe, on a bag. And that has never been linked to anybody. And as far as, you know, other blood or, or semen, things like that, uh, this happened in 1990. So yeah. they didn't have a lot of the advanced techniques that we still, that we have today. But there's no, there's nothing pushing Shaker Heights police to reopen this case and take another hard look at the evidence, unfortunately, because in their mind, it's it's solved. They the police still believe that Kevin Young is the person who did it. So, um, but they should be. I mean, if they wanted to, they could retest the evidence to see if they can find DNA th- these days. Mm-hmm. They, I know for a fact that they have evidence in the Porter's murders that could. Um, yield dna they have uh poor uh, mrs porter she was stabbed but she was also strangled with the cord to an iron in her basement and that iron the cord has got to have the perpetrator's dna on it i I, absolutely sure it's got to have that so that could easily be tested and has never been tested Mm mm-hmm Wow, I never heard about the bloody footprint. So. What about anything on her clothing? Any fingerprints like that, or I don't know. If I mean, be uh, hard to again, find. Uh, not that not that they were able to see in 1990, as far as I know, but certainly they could. They have better techniques today that that might yield some of that information for sure. Yeah, it would just take them opening the case back up to yeah. re- re-examine that stuff. And since Kevin's deceased, then he'll... Yep. Yeah. Do you know exactly uh, how he passed? Because it's hard to find... How who? Kevin. Who passed? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. Uh, Kevin. Kevin Young? Yeah. Um, Kevin Young also essentially drank himself to death. Okay. So, um, and there were these rumors at the time of his death, and I believe it's... I, I think he died in 2017 as well, or maybe 18, but um, it was right around the time of Brannigan, actually, not wow. too far away. And um, uh, But Kevin Young uh, had a history of alcohol abuse. Um, he, he was found, uh, so at the time of his death, he was living in, uh, he was renting out the third floor of a house. Uh, and not necessarily the best part of Cleveland. And the owner of the house lived there and was a young man, I think, had some issues himself. And, but he had a camera uh, on the that looked out at the driveway. And a couple of days went by and he's like, man, I haven't seen I haven't seen Kevin. And so he went back and looked at the footage and he was able to see Kevin Young coming into his house, but never saw him leaving. He's like, oh, my God, something went, something's happened to him. So 
he went up and they he and uh, uh, another person took the door off the hinges and walked in and, and Kevin's body was on the mm. floor and he had been dead for some time. Um, and that the apartment up there was a mess. Um, he was not in, I, I, I don't think he was in the best mental health at the end. Um, his, he had a mattress on the floor and the mattress had kind of fused into the floor. Um, there were a lot of empty uh, alcohol cans and they found, uh, I think they found two different crack pipes up there. So, um, you know, it, all that took a toll on his body yeah. and, uh, and his liver and he, he, he died, you mm -hmm. know, very young, um, so, and, and tragically, but he had never come out from underneath the umbrella of suspicion in Shaker Heights. Right. And, uh, you know, so it was a, it was a rough life. Hmm. This case is so hard to research. Do you know if Lisa Pruitt was, was she buried or was she cremated? Do you know what her final arrangements were? Good question. Um, I don't, I don't think she was cremated and, uh, I forget. I did find out somewhere where she was buried. She does have a little memorial plaque, I believe, um, at a Girl Scout camp someplace. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'd have to go back and look at my notes. Yeah. Cause I have looked relentlessly trying to find out, you know, where her, what happened to her, where, you know, where she was buried or anything. And I can't find anything on her. Hmm. So. I'll, I'll, go, I'll look through if I, if I find it again, if I come across it, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Cool. Um, but yeah, her family you know, is very tragic. You know, she was a family of three or three children and the parents. And, uh, she was, uh, her younger, I think a younger brother, but she had a brother anyways who passed away at a young age before her. Um, oh, wow. and I don't remember the circumstances of that. Um, <clears throat> um, it was not, you know, foul play. It was some sort of medical condition, I believe. Um, it, I think I have that right, but you know, so the, those poor parents had already lost a, a kid and then they lose Lisa like this. And, uh, so she does have a brother who's still alive and doing well, I believe, but mm. never had a chance to talk to him. Yeah. Do you know if they still live in Shaker Heights? Did they stay they there? They do not. No, they moved away. They moved out of state for a couple of years. They are back in Ohio, but they're not in Shaker Heights. Okay. Yeah. It would be, that would be traumatic to stay there. I'm sure. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Dale, you got anything you want to ask? I'm thinking, no. I'm, yeah, we came into this with a, a ton of questions, but we're just you, sitting here with our jaw on the table, listening to you because this is just great. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, you <laughs> talking, you, you've answered a lot of questions. Just you spilling all this to us. So he's this, filling in all the holes. Yeah, you filled in a lot of holes, no doubt. Oh, good, good. Yeah. You know, um, with back to Bran again, if if he did murder the porters, uh, these other two boys who were with him that night certainly either know he did it or have suspicions that he might have did it um and i'm really hoping that they'll tell their their story once this book comes out uh, mm -hmm. or hopefully the police look cl more closely at at their at their version of events um but they would you know that would be ex extremely helpful as if they were able to tell us oh yeah i'm sorry i was you know i was scared to death because i was 15 years old at the time so i i didn't i couldn't tell you but you know i know david broke into that house and um and killed the porters and came out and you know we were stupid kids and i i, I was too afraid to say anything at the time mm -hmm. hopefully hopefully something like that happens yeah i'd heard too i think it was kim rathmon that stated that Lisa had never met Dan's parents or or his father, and hmm. I'd heard another place that she had met his father. I just didn't know if they had a, any kind of relationship or any kind of connection. Or yeah, that's kind of strange. Um, I think uh, uh, I know. You know, Lisa definitely saw both of his parents the night of the murder. Um, she her father brought her over 
around 9.30, and she spent about 10 minutes with Dan. Mm -hmm. Um, But, uh, yeah, she had certainly met his father in passing, at least before, a couple times. Because they went to prom together the, the year before that too yeah right and there was also uh where did that that weird information came from where he said that maybe her, his dad had uh, had a thing for her you heard that, that that was one of the one of the students that were interviewed um that was just that was one of those rumors around town you know who knows if there was any any truth to that right yeah okay yeah, and I think uh, that same girl also said something about, um, uh, oh, heck. oh, about where he said, you know, we know that uh, Dan had been to her house several times, but she didn't think that Lisa had ever came to his house late at night and then turned right around and said, but they always sit in his basement and he played guitar for her. So I'm like, well, I guess yeah. she, she did go there. Yeah. <laughs> so she, there's a lot of contradictions in her story, like you said. Yeah, yeah. They're They're trying to figure out what they should be saying and what they shouldn't be sh- right. be, be be saying. Well, Lisa's Pru- Lisa Pruitt's murder is definitely a, a tragic story, and we yeah. wanted to cover it and fill in all the holes and all the questions that we had about it. Because, you know, I was yeah, like great. I said, I was really stumped on this when you know True Crime Garage covered it and listened to all the interviews, and and then we came across your article that we kind of used as our, as our timeline when we did the, our podcast, actually. Yeah. Oh, great. Great. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for shining light on the uh, on the case. I think it's an important one, and and hopefully they'll they'll be able to close it and and consider it solved one day. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully so. She deserves that. It's awful. Well, James Renner, sure. thank you so much for being on the show. We really really appreciate it. Yeah. It's a, oh, you an bet. Honor. Anytime. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Thank you. Yep. See ya. All right. See ya. Wild Dale. I'm telling you. We want to thank James Renner for being on the show. Need a Band-Aid for a chin from how many times I hit the table today. <laughs> my chin has dropped to the floor. I don't know how many times. Oh, that was amazing, man. Yeah, it really opened some, my eyes on uh, Lisa Pruitt case and some questions I had. And he really filled in the holes on this and brought it a lot more to light. Yeah, and we really, really appreciate you giving us your time and uh, coming in here and speaking with us and uh, filling in a lot of holes. Yep, we do appreciate it, James. All right, Dale, we are going to get out of here, man. Well, let's roll. We want everyone to be safe, be careful, and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is The, the Crack, Crack House, House Chronicles. Chronicles.